I want to uh, thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. It's a little bit unusual, I think, to have an eye surgeon speaking to physicists. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, honored that you would allow me to come and share some thoughts with you uh, about the role of voltage in the body. Um, now, um, I always start my lectures by announcing that I'm not speaking with my Texas MD license. The medical board in the state of Texas does not allow its physicians to talk about anything that's not standard of care medicine. And of course, standard of care medicine is pharmaceutical medicine, surgery, and physical therapy. And obviously, what I'm talking about today involves other things. So I'm speaking today with my Arizona homeopathic and integrative medicine license. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, certain people that have contributed greatly to, to much of the information I'm going to share today. This is the Tenet Institute staff, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Marr and Dr. Hyde in the audience with us. Um, and uh, if, if there are those of you who become intrigued by some of the things we're talking about, they'll be happy to help demonstrate to you how all of this works. In addition, I want to acknowledge uh, Eileen McCusick, whom uh, you heard speak this morning, and her major contributions to this area as well. So thank you, Eileen. So what are emotions? Well, people talk about having them, but most people don't have a real good definition of what they really are and how they work. In addition, as in the over 50 years I've been in medicine, People have talked sort of in passing about the mind-body connection, but I found it was difficult to get anybody to explain to me what that meant. How does that really work? Well, they say, well, you know, if you have emotions, it makes you get sick. Okay, how does that work? And I found it difficult to find any uh, solution or answer to that question. So the reality is that none of us can get through life without having emotional events. We have losses. Uh, loved ones die or disappoint us, our dreams go unfulfilled, we go bankrupt, we have car wrecks, we suffer injuries, all sorts of things happen. And then, of course, we now have this uh, big uh, epidemic in our country of soldiers uh, returning from war and committing suicide. Uh, so this business about post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome is, uh, of course, become a major issue for us, and nobody really knows very well how to handle it. And here's a list of all of the various things that can happen with that. But we find that more and more people that aren't soldiers are having post-traumatic stress uh, syndromes as well. So we need to get a handle on how to deal with that. Now, when this Time Magazine cover came out, we were only losing one soldier a day. Now it's up to 20 a day. So 20 of our veterans a day are committing suicide. So we obviously need to figure out a way to deal with that. Now, the, the reality is that um, deployment and suicide are not necessarily related um, in the studies that have been done. But um, the uh, important point, I think, of the uh, military suicides is that pharmaceuticals are not very effective. Uh, so most people know that, and the studies have been done to show that uh, there's really not a uh, pharmaceutical that does very much in helping deal with uh, suicides and the emotions that go with it. And the, I'm just passing through the studies that have been published about that. Now, in my observation, if you have treatment failures, it usually means you're using the wrong paradigm. And so I'm going to suggest to you a different paradigm uh, as we go through the day. Um, but I'd first like to tell you how I ended up sitting in this chair. I'm trained as an ophthalmologist and an ophthalmic plastic surgery, a surgeon, and I did the majority of the research for the laser that's used in LASIK surgery by the company called Visex. And I had a lot of fun doing that research, but unfortunately we didn't know at the time that uh, the laser wouldn't kill viruses. 
So as I would be treating eyes, and particularly I treated this one fellow from India that had scars on his corneas, and I used the, the laser to, to uh, remove those scars, but he had leukemia. Well, we didn't know that the laser wouldn't kill viruses, and so the viruses came up uh, off his eye, through my mask, into my nose, and into my brain, and I developed encephalitis. And so I, the result of that was that I could see a patient and know what was wrong with them, but I couldn't remember how to write a prescription. And I'd, in addition to that, I developed spastic movements, so I'd be sitting there and do something like that, which doesn't work really well if you're operating inside somebody's eyeball. Uh, and so for all of those reasons, I had to quit working at the end of November 1995. So I spent about 16 hours a day in bed sleeping, and I had two or three hours a day in which I could think clearly enough to understand a newspaper, and then like a light switch would go off and I couldn't understand it anymore. So during that two or three hours a day I could think, I had to figure out how to get myself well because the best doctors I could find at NIH in Boston and New York and wherever just said, well, you got three viruses in your brain, we don't know what to do about it, go home and don't call us, we'll call you. So during the two or three hours a day that I could think, I began to uh, try to figure out how to get myself well. And I began to think about the fact that all the cells in the body work very much the same, even though they look different, but that if I could figure out how to make one cell work, I could make them all work. And so I went out and bought uh, 10 or 15 books on cellular biology and started reading them, which I hadn't done for about 30 years. And one of the things that resonated me with, uh, to me with those various books was that each one uh, talked about the fact that cells are designed to run at a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. And so I didn't really know too much about pH. I remembered that it was something about have to do with acid-base balance, but I didn't really know a great deal more about it. So as I began to look at pH, I began to realize that pH describes voltage in a liquid. So if you think about the wires that are bringing the voltage into these lights and, and to your computers, etc., that's conductive electricity, of course, with electrons flowing through a copper wire. But if you talk about a solution, a solution has the opportunity to be either an electron donor or an electron stealer. So in order to figure out which it is, you use a sophisticated voltmeter, so to speak, called a pH meter. And when you measure a liquid with a pH meter, it will uh, give you the, either the pH or you can flip a switch and it will give, read it out in millivolts. So the reality then is voltage in a liquid uh, we call pH. And by convention, um, if you find that the solution is an electron stealer, you put a plus sign in front of the voltage. And if it's an electron donor, you put a minus sign in front of it. And then you convert the voltage that you measure with a logarithmic scale going from 0 to 14 and call that pH. So plus 400 millivolts of electron stealer is the same as a pH of zero, whereas minus 400 millivolts of electron donor is the same thing as a pH of 14. And if it's neutral, if it's neither electron donor or electron stealer, then that's a pH of seven. So when we say that cells must run at a uh, pH of 7.5, to 7.45, we are saying cells must run between minus 20 and minus 25 millivolts. Well, that was a wowser for me. Guess what? Cells need energy to work. That makes sense. Now, by the way, people sometimes get confused with these numbers because if you take a cell in a petri dish and you put an electrode inside the cell and one outside the cell and you measure across the cell membrane, you get about minus 90 millivolts. But hopefully not very many of you have your cells in petri dishes. But in the environment of this body, they're designed to run at minus, 25, minus 20 to minus 25 millivolts. So one of the things that you will find is the characteristic of essentially all chronic disease is that you have low voltage going to that organ. So, um, so we are constantly wearing ourselves out and um, needing to uh, make new cells. 
So what I'm seeing here is one slide behind that one, apparently. Okay. So we are constantly wearing ourselves out and having to make new cells. So the macula in your eye today is uh, only 48 hours old. In other words, you get new cells in the macula every 48 hours. The lining of your gut is three weeks old. The skin you're sitting in today is six weeks old. Your liver's eight months, uh, it's eight weeks old, and your nervous system is eight months old. So we are constantly wearing ourselves out and having to make new cells. So it turns out then that chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells at work. Let me say that one more time. Chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells at work. Well, if that's the case then, we need to ask the question, what does it take to make a new cell that works? Well, as I mentioned, it takes minus 25 millivolts for a cell to run, but to make a new one it takes double that. It takes minus 50 millivolts. And then in addition to having the voltage to make new cells, we have to have all of the, of the nutrients to make a new cell. So if your house gets blown down with a tornado and you have to build a new one, guess what? You have to have everything you need to bake it. You can't build a new house with doorknobs and bathroom tiles. You have to have shingles and rafters and uh, doors and windows, etc. You have to have everything it takes. And this is a big mistake people make when they're trying to get well, is they try one substance at a time, saying that, well, I want to see what works. Well, it's not going to work, because you yeah, have to have everything all at one time to build a new cell. So we have to have minus 50 millivolts of energy. We have to have everything it takes to make a cell. And then we have to deal with any of the toxins that are hanging around that damage cells as fast as we make them. And the most common toxins we have to deal with are heavy metals like mercury, toxins coming out of our teeth, and GMO foods uh, with the pesticide called Roundup or glyphosate. Now, the body actually has four different battery packs because the human body is a portable electronic device. Like all electronic devices, it has to have a battery pack or multiple battery packs. And so the reality is that we have these four different packs. Now, the largest one of all is our muscles. Now, our muscles are piezoelectric. And for those of you who aren't physicists, that word, funny word piezoelectricity means that if you stress a substance and it emits electrons, that's called piezoelectricity. So when I move my muscles, I'm generating electrons, which is, by the way, why exercise is so important, because exercise is the way the human body is designed to recharge your own personal battery pack. But the reality is also that our muscles are rechargeable batteries. And so we have then these large muscles, which are our main batteries. And then th these muscles, uh, battery packs, are all hooked to our cell membranes. Now, cell membranes are capacitors. So what is a capacitor? Well, a capacitor is a small battery. And the way our cell membranes are designed is with a couple of uh, opposing layers of funny fats called phospholipids. And these fats have a ball and then two legs. Well, the balls are electron conductors and the legs are insulators. So when you put them like this, you have two conductors separated by insulator, which by definition is a capacitor, which means it stores electrons. And then inside the cell, we have a mitochondria. And inside the mitochondria, we have another rechargeable battery system. When that, uh, that battery system is charged up, we call it ATP. And then it, as it gives away its electrons and discharges, we call it ADP. Well, because we have a rechargeable battery system inside our mitochondria, guess what else we need in there? A battery charger. And the battery charger inside the cell is called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle runs on uh, primarily fatty acids. And so as you put fatty acids through the Krebs cycle, it creates electrons. And for every unit of uh, fatty acids that you put through the Krebs cycle, if oxygen is present, you get enough electrons to charge up 38 of these ATP batteries. Now, in addition, we have the DNA. 
Now, DNA inside of our cells, we generally tend to look at it from the side, and we see it look like we took, took a couple of step, uh, st uh, step ladders and twisted them. But if you look at it from the top, it looks like this. And uh, every circle of DNA is golden mean, and what that means is that it's 1.618 times uh, the uh, diameter is 1.618 times the, the uh, height and so forth. And any place in the universe where there is something that's golden mean or in the shape of a platonic solid, it will cause implosion of scalar energy. So because our DNA is golden mean, it, uh, then scalar implodes into it and gives it its charge so it has the energy to do its job. So then we have our muscles then are stacked one on top of each other in a very specific order, like stacking batteries in a flashlight. And so surrounding these, this stack of muscle batteries, we have a substance called fascia, which is very much like a stocking. And of course, fascia is that shiny stuff you see when you carve the Christmas turkey. Now, the interesting thing about fascia is that fascia is a semiconductor. So what in the world is a semiconductor? A semiconductor is a collection of molecules arranged in such a way that electrons move through it at the speed of light, but only in one direction. So we have then this con continuous stack of fascia going from our toes up to our brain or from our uh, fingers up to our brain and uh, surrounded by this stocking, which serves basically as the wiring system for the body. So we have then the stack of muscle batteries surrounded by the fascia so that every organ in the body has its own battery pack. Because every organ in the body has its own battery pack, then we have the ability to isolate, uh, measure that voltage and figure out why that organ's malfunctioning. Now a stack of muscle batteries is what's been called an acupuncture meridian. So an acupuncture meridian is simply a stack of muscle batteries. Now, um, so this is an example of uh, an acupuncture meridian called the spleen meridian. And the spleen meridian, oops, go back the other way. There you go. So the spleen meridian starts down in the big toe, goes up the inside of the leg, and um, then it goes, there's a special branch, as you can see, goes over to the female genitalia. Then it goes around the back where it gets the adrenal glands, the spleen and the pancreas. Then it goes on up into the neck and makes a loop and hooks into what's called the stomach circuit. And then the stomach circuit gets the macula of the eye. So by the way, if anybody has macular degeneration, it's because you have low voltage in your stomach circuit. The, it powers the frontal lobes, which is the thinking part of your brain. Then it gets the thyroid, the breast, the stomach, the male genitalia, and then back down to the big toe, so it makes a loop. So we have six of these loops of muscle batteries that provide the 25 millivolts you need for the organs to work and the 50 millivolts to repair them. So chronic disease occurs when one of these muscle battery packs won't hold a charge. So then that leads us to the question, well, why won't that battery pack hold a charge? Well, the, um, there is a uh, checklist that you can go through to try to figure out why it, won't hold, why it won't hold a charge. But basically, you have to look at thyroid hormone because the th thyroid hormone T3 controls the voltage of every cell membrane in the body and T2 controls the voltage in the mitochondria. So you have to be sure and get the thyroid hormone levels correct. Then if you were to put a scar across one of these circuits, so if you put a scar across one of these muscle battery packs here, it's going to short it out and it'll drain off some of the voltage. So scars are, uh, can be a significant problem, but the only scars that really take you completely down are those on the main line on your main cable. A scar across your knee or something will generally just lower it a few millivolts, but enough to cause some problems. In addition, Emotions are stored in the body as magnetic fields. So if you have a magnetic field that's uh, stuck in one of these muscle battery packs here, it's going to block the voltage so it won't go through. And then finally, dental infections are a significant problem 
because each of these circuits go through very specific teeth. So here you see that we have this main cable that goes up the back and down the front. And then from that main cable, you get uh, the voltage coming from our arms and our legs. And they come up to these lateral uh, terminals. And then from those lateral terminals, they go to this center one. And then it starts looping around the body. And it went, as it loops around the back, uh, it has the option then of going out and attaching to the ganglia that are up and down the spinal cord, which we call the autonomic ganglia. And then from the autonomic ganglia, it goes to every organ in the body. So that's the human body's wiring system and battery pack system. And so whenever you have chronic disease, you will have failure of one of these electronic systems. So you simply have to start out whenever you have some sort of uh, illness, asking the question, so what's the battery pack to that illness? So if you have heart disease, you would say, what's the battery pack for the heart? Well, it's obviously the heart uh, muscle battery pack. There are others that are not as, as obvious. For example, this, the example I gave you of spleen stomach, the spleen stomach circuit is the power supply for the entire endocrine system, the entire reproductive system in both males and females, the macula of the eye, and the thinking part of the brain. And of course, when that system goes out, which is the, one of the more common ones to go out, then you start having failure of those organ systems. So how do we know if the voltage is low in a circuit? Well, we have the ability to measure it with certain acupuncture points uh, using what amounts to a uh, specially designed ohmmeter. Now, um, as we began to then identify the power packs uh, that is uh, not working correctly, we have two things in front of us. One is to figure out why that battery pack won't hold a charge. And then the second is to try to recharge the battery pack while we're figuring out how to fix the reason that we got into trouble in the first place. So, um, we have developed this device called a biotransducer that puts out both electromagnetic and scalar energy and if you simply aim it at the uh, failing organ, you can begin to recharge the cells in that organ itself. And then you want to come behind it and you want to charge the muscle battery packs. And these diagrams that we have here where you see the red and the black uh, dots show you where to, uh, to put the polarity because every battery pack, like every other battery you're aware of, has, its, has terminals in polarity. So you take patches and you stick the patches on to where the, uh, the terminals of the, that battery pack that uh, doesn't have enough charge, uh, hook it onto the biomodulator, which is a little portable device that looks a bit like a computer mouse and it puts out uh, waveforms that are designed to implode energy and transfer energy to the cells and recharge your muscle battery packs. So you're, you're recharging the organ, you're recharging the muscle battery packs while you're working on figuring out, well, why uh, won't that battery pack hold a charge in the first place? Now, one of the interesting things is that our bodies are wired up like uh, many circuit boards. As you know, many uh, electronic circuit boards use Tesla resonating circuits. A Tesla resonating circuit is a combination of a capacitor and a coil wired in parallel. And when you do that, uh, it has the ability to communicate with other uh, systems that are a combination of Tesla uh, resonating circuits. So in the body, the lung is always wired to the large intestine, the heart's always wired to the small intestine, the, the spleen and pancreas are always wired to the stomach, the kidney's always wired to the bladder, and the liver's always wired to the gallbladder. Each of these create in a Tesla resonating circuit. And because they are Tesla circuits, they're able to communicate with each other. So one part of our body knows what's going on in the other part of the body because we're wired up with Tesla resonating circuits. Now, all of these various circuits in the body go through very specific teeth. And so the teeth act like circuit breakers. So if you um, begin to have uh, an infection in one of your teeth, it will uh, at first begin to reduce the voltage that's in that circuit and later 
actually switch it off. So the circuit we've been talking about, the spleen stomach circuit, is the one that you see in yellow here. It's the upper molars and lower premolars. And so the, um, if you have uh, an infection in uh, an upper molar, then it's going to begin to affect your spleen stomach circuit, which means it's going to affect, as I mentioned, your entire reproductive system, your entire endocrine system, the thinking part of your brain and the macula of your eye. So most people with macular degeneration have an infection in an upper molar uh, on the same side as their macular degeneration. Now, one of the issues then is um, how do teeth enter into this whole system? Well, it turns out that uh, the teeth appear to function similar to the way that a lymph node does in the lymphatic system. If you have infection in your lymphatic system and it goes up the lymphatics, it gets caught and trapped in a lymph node. Well, emotions are trapped in the body as magnetic fields, and those magnetic fields tend to end up being trapped in teeth as well. And so uh, what you'll find is that the majority of chronic illness actually begins with an emotional event. Let me say that one more time. The majority of chronic disease actually begins as an emotional event. And that emotion is a magnetic field that starts blocking the circuit by getting caught in one of the teeth. And as it does so, it begins to lower the voltage in the tooth. Now, Dr. Steinman showed that every tooth uh, has within it a pump that pumps fluid from inside the tooth to inside the mouth, and that's what keeps you from getting cavities. Your kids will be happy to know that it's not snicker bars that are causing their cavities, it's the failure of this pump. So when the pump begins to fail, then infection comes from the mouth into the tooth and begins to cause decay. So the emotion begins to, to lower the voltage enough in the tooth that the pump begins to fail, and then you begin to get a cavity, and then you begin to get a crown, and then you begin to eventually keep going until you get a root canal, and then that uh, leads eventually to having a malignancy. So again, most of the chronic disease occurs, uh, begins as, a, uh, as emotions. Now, obviously, there are some circumstances where that's not the case. If you were living in Tokyo when Fukushima blew up and you were radiated, obviously that's not necessarily an emotional event in the sense that you may not have known you just got radiated, but it's going to make you sick. But generally speaking, most of the emotions, or most of the chronic disease we have, we can trace back to an emotion that has blocked a particular uh, ba a muscle battery pack by blocking the tooth that's involved with it. Now, when you look at this particular slide, you might ask the question, didn't anybody ever teach you not to put so many numbers on one slide? Well, I did it on purpose because I wanted you to get the gestalt of it. So what you will see is that the relationship, you'll see that um, here that uh, a pH of 7.35 is the same as minus 20 millivolts, 7.44 is the same as minus 25. So that's where our, organ, our cells normally run. But as voltage begins to drop, then things begin to get uh, worse and worse for us until we finally get down to plus 30 millivolts. All cancers occur at plus 30 millivolts. So, what you see is that normal tissue is running at electron donor, which is minus 25 millivolts. And as you go past zero, you have flipped the polarity. That is that every, every battery, as you know, has a plus on one end and a minus on the other. And as you drain the battery all the way to zero, it flips its polarity upside down. And so uh, when the polarity uh, reverses, is when we, and it gets all the way down to plus 30 millivolts is when malignancies occur. Now we don't have time to really go into that in much detail today, but the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in water is dictated by the voltage of the water. So as the water inside of our cells uh, has lower and lower voltage, then the oxygen in the cell comes out of the cell and disappears. And when you finally flip the polarity, there is so little oxygen uh, capability in the cell that the stem cells recognize that signal that, hey, we just ran out of oxygen here, please help. 
and so stem cells go over and invade the local uh, blood supply and create a mass of blood vessels that we call a cancer, which is uh, indistinguishable from a placenta in a pregnant female. So basically all solid tumors are placentas uh, that the is the body's way of responding to lack of voltage and oxygen. So if we um, begin then to think about the, um, the way that this works, think about my thumb. My thumb is a perfectly good thumb, by the way. It's running at what voltage? Minus 25 millivolts. Now I hit it with a hammer and I destroy some cells in my thumb. What's going to happen is that the thumb is immediately going to go to minus 50 millivolts. And minus 50 millivolts causes the arterioles to dilate. And the reason that happens, of course, is we need the raw materials dumped at the curb there, so to speak, so that we can rebuild the cells we destroyed with the hammer. Well, when those capillaries dilate, we get all the signs we normally call inflammation. We have redness, we have swelling, we have heat, we have a pulsing pain, and it makes you say bad words. So my thumb gets busy and it makes new cells, it replaces those I smashed with a hammer, it goes back to minus 25 millivolts, and I'm a happy camper. But on the other hand, if when I smash my thumb, if the power supply going to the thumb is inadequate to provide the minus 50 millivolts I need to make new cells, then my thumb won't heal and I'm stuck in chronic disease. You see that? So I can take all the pills I want, I can do all the surgery I want on the thumb, but it'll never get well until I do what? Insert enough electrons to get me up to minus 50 millivolts. And so if you understand what I just told you about the thumb, you understand basically my whole lecture. So I can go home now. Oh, no, wait a minute. Um, still a little bit more, but the point is that chronic disease occurs when you don't have enough voltage to make new cells. And so, um, so as voltage begins to drop, then oxygen begins to drop. And when oxygen drops, there are several bad things that begin to happen. Um, the, one of the things that, as I mentioned earlier, is that the, uh, you began to have less ATP, which is the voltage inside the cell that the cell needs to do its business. Now, I also mentioned to you uh, that as, uh, because of the Krebs cycle being able to make, to recharge 38 of these um, ATP batteries uh, for every unit of fatty acid you put through the Krebs cycle, that's only true if oxygen is available. If oxygen is unavailable, then for every unit of fatty acid you put through the, the battery charger, you only get enough electrons to charge up two batteries. So it's a bit like having a car that goes from 38 miles a gallon to two miles a gallon. Your cells become very inefficient. Now, in addition to having inefficiency of the intracellular voltage, we have problems with bugs. Now, the body contains perhaps a trillion bugs of various kinds, and the majority of them are suppressed by oxygen. But as oxygen levels begin to drop because voltage drops, then these bugs wake up. And the first thing the bugs want to do is have lunch, and they want to have you for lunch. Now, bugs don't have teeth, so they can take a bite out of you, so instead they put out digestive enzymes to dissolve your cells so they can get the nutrients. So think about having a sore throat. Uh, the strep bacteria on your tonsils having a picnic and they're having a good old time, but you have the world's worst sore throat, you have a headache, you have a fever, you, you have vomiting, you have diarrhea, your joints hurt, you're having a miserable day, and it's because the bugs are having uh, uh, their way by putting out these digestive enzymes to, um, to get their nutrients out of the cells. Now, one of the things is that as as voltage and oxygen drop more and more, these microorganisms lose their cell membranes. So they become what have been called cell wall deficient organisms or stealth pathogens. One of the problems with that is, first of all, you can't culture them. Secondly, you don't see them with a standard microscope. You need one of these fancy microscopes called phase contrast or dark field microscope. And the um, these bugs then put out various toxins and began to damage the local tissue 
And often what we call an autoimmune disease is simply ha these bugs having their way with uh, your local tissue. So as they put out their toxins, you get the signs of inflammation and swelling and so forth. But if you try to culture anything or look at a biopsy of that area, you don't see anything because uh, normal hospitals and physicians' offices don't use one of these microscopes so, where you can actually see them. In these uh, images that you see on the screen, you see uh, these various cell wall deficient bugs inside red blood cells, consuming them. In the lower right, you see uh, where I took red blood cells, put it under a cover slip on a microscope uh, slide and let it sit there for a few hours. And as it consumed all of the oxygen, you see the Lyme spirochetes come crawling out of the red cells. So everybody in this room has Lyme disease. It's just whether or not your immune system has the ability to deal with it, whether you have symptoms from it. So then as the voltage gets down toward plus 30 millivolts, then the cell wall deficient fungus shows up and you begin to have these kinds of uh, cells. This is a blood from a fellow who had leukemia and you can see the fungal forms in his blood that the fungus is always associated with, uh, with these kinds of things. Um, so, I'm going to skip past this as just a better microscopic view, and I want to go to uh, talk to you a minute more about teeth because it's terribly important in the understanding how to get people well. Now, if you look at the lower left image, you see a car battery that has corrosion around it, which means that the alternator in that car is going to have trouble keeping that battery charged up. Well, the tooth just above it is attached to a muscle battery, but it also has corrosion and thus it also has trouble keeping that battery charged up. And then as corrosion in either your car battery or your tooth gets worse over time, then it gets harder and harder and harder and harder to keep your battery packs charged up. And uh, eventually in the car battery, the corrosion will come outside the, the battery itself and start corroding through your uh, battery cable, which now means you have a total short circuit and your car won't start. Well, this process occurs in the body when the infection in the tooth moves out into the bone. So when you have infection in a bone around a tooth, it actually works just like a circuit breaker and shake, takes down that circuit. And then the two circumstances in which that occurs is either a root canal tooth, which is of course a dead tooth. Most of you may know the way you do a root canal is you drill a little hole in the top of the tooth and you put an auger down in and you rip out the artery and rip out the nerve and kill the tooth and then you fill it with putty. Um, you know, the problem is that uh, now the tooth is dead and all dead tissue gets infected. The dentists are the only physicians that believe you can get away with leaving dead tissue in the body. No other doctor believes that. So uh, one root canal tooth shuts down 63% of your immune system. So, and then what makes it worse is that uh, it then gets out into the bone and when it gets into the bone, it, it shuts off that circuit and so now the voltage drops significantly in that circuit. And that's why you find in the, we looked at all the cancer patients we've seen in our clinic and 95% of them are associated with a root canal or an infected uh, uh, bone where the, uh, a tooth had been pulled, 95%. So a, a leading contributor to cancer is having an infection in the bone uh, around one of the teeth. Now, in addition to root canals, it's, there's a problem when teeth get pulled because teeth are held into the bone by a ligament called the periodontal ligament. What dentists are trained to do is wiggle the tooth, make it loose, take it out, put a stitch in, quit, leaving the ligament behind. When you do that, it's very hard for the bone to heal because the ligament's in the way. And even if the dentist happens to be one who takes the time to scrape out that ligament because the mouth's such a dirty place, oftentimes people get infection in the bone uh, during the first few days of healing once a tooth's been pulled. So once you, and that's called a cavitation, by the way. So whether you have infection from a root canal or from a cavitation, it tends to shut down the circuit. And one of the problems is that infection in the bone then tends to move over and take out the next circuit. So a huge problem is that uh, our kids are in high school. 
they go to the dentist and they say, oh, you got to get your wisdom teeth out. It's that old thing of, well, if you go to Midas, you get a muffler. So um, a study came out last year showing that 65% of root canal extractions were unnecessary. Well, nevertheless, they get their, their, their wisdom teeth pulled, and now they start getting infection in that area. And the wisdom teeth uh, circuit is heart, small intestine, but listen, it's the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system is the body's on-off switches. So all of a sudden, within days after getting their wisdom teeth extracted, the kids have lost their on-off switch, which means they, their body doesn't know how to control itself. Then over time, it begins to move next door and takes out the spleen stomach circuit. Now remember that the spleen circuit is the power supply to the adrenal glands. So now soon they've lost their, uh, their uh, control panel, their on-off system, and then they lose their adrenals so they can't deal with stress. And so they began to become what many people say, oh, he's just a teenager. Well, no, he's not just a teenager. He's lost his, his ability, the whole way the body deals with stress. And so many of our kids hide themselves within electronics because within the electronics, they have an on-off switch. In their body, they don't. So they can't deal with the real world anymore. And so they hide within uh, their cell phone and their uh, Game Boys or whatever you call them. Nevertheless, this is a huge problem. Uh, now, when you lose, I only got five minutes left. So, when you lose your ability to make adrenaline, you go down the following slippery slope. You have trouble uh, going to sleep. You have trouble dealing with stress. You have trouble with um, uh, your memory. And then you can't multitask. So you're sitting reading a book or watching TV and somebody says, hey, do you want mustard or mayonnaise? You become very annoyed because they interrupted you. But you don't have the mental horsepower to stay attached to whatever you're doing, so you detach, you pick mustard, you go back to your book, and now you can't remember your place, and you're even more annoyed. And then it gets to where you don't like any stimulus, so you don't like loud noises, loud music, rowdy crowds, can't be around people who are arguing. And eventually it gets to where you don't even want to be touched, you just want to sit in a corner and have people leave you the heck alone. And then your sexual equipment quits working. And then you can't go to sleep before 11. And when you wake up, you're still tired. All of that's due to the lack, to loss of the spleen power supply to your adrenals. Well, what I've just described, of course, is very destructive. If you can't deal with the life or the world, you can't be a good spouse. And particularly if your sexual equipment doesn't work anymore, then that's a big uh, problem in a marriage. Uh, you can't be a good parent because uh, kids uh, make noise and want something from you and you have nothing to give. You can't be a good worker, you can't be a good friend, you can't be good of much of anything so your life's in the toilet simply because you've lost the spleen circuit that goes to the adrenal glands. And that's a huge problem in our uh, society. Well, now, um, Eileen McCusick uh, spoke earlier about mapping the field of emotions and this is the the traditional Chinese one, so that the various circuits have these various sorts of emotions get stuck in these various particular places or in the teeth that are, that are associated with these. Dr. Bannis uh, published these, and of course, uh, Eileen has published hers, which is this group of, uh, of uh, where things get stuck. And, as far as erasing emotions are concerned, because emotions are a magnetic field, you can erase them with a stronger magnetic field. One of the laws of physics is if you take any magnet and you put a stronger magnet over it, then the weaker magnet assumes the characteristics of the stronger one. And so when you have these um, emotions that are stuck, you can begin to erase them in a variety of different ways. Now, there are various groups over the years that have looked at this subject and tried to, to figure out how to do it. EFT, Psych K, Emotion Code, Psychosomatic Energetics, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly, the, we had developed one where you can, if you can think about emotion while holding onto these uh, hand grips with your biomodulator, you could erase the emotion. But when we did that, we were doing in one emotion at the time. And of course, um, 
Eileen talked to you this morning about using her tuning fork to do it, which is very effective. What I have recently found is that um, if you treat the uh, wisdom teeth, which treats your autonomic nervous system, then you can begin to knock out, you can not only change the polarity in all of your various circuits at one time, but also knock out many of the motions automatically. Now, a pendulum is actually a, like a single string on a guitar, and the weight on the pendulum makes the streak taut. So when, you move, when it's moved, it's actually resonating with whatever frequency the string is. So what you do is you hold this pendulum over um, the small intestine, heart, small intestine, autonomic system, and you take the biotransducer and simply put it over the wisdom teeth and you watch the pendulum and it'll always be spinning backwards if the voltage is low, counterclockwise, and you keep holding it there and pretty soon it'll slow down and then it'll start spinning clockwise. And then you do the same on the other side, again holding the pendulum over the heart small intestine circuit, put the biotransducer over the autonomic system at, where you can access it with the tooth, watch it spin backwards and in the correct way, and now when you go back and check all of the circuits, you've corrected the polarity in every circuit, and many of the emotions that you had found out in the, the biofield are already uh, gone as well. So, um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to talk to you about how we're wired up with, uh, with polarity and with uh, uh, how our bodies uh, all gold and mean and how implosion occurs, if you're interested in those subjects, then um, we have some videos that will help you in that area. Plus, uh, we'll be giving some demonstration. If there are any of you in the audience who happen to have any motion, anybody here? Uh, we'll be doing some uh, demonstrations uh, in the uh, breakout room. So what I've hoped to accomplish in these few minutes I had to talk with you is to help you understand that the body uh, is a, an electronic device which uh, has a, uh, multiple battery packs, and the chronic disease occurs when those battery packs won't hold a charge, and that getting well involves you identifying which battery packs are failing you, identifying the reason that they're failing you and fixing that, so that it's uh, basically what we're doing is like you coming home from work and opening the fridge and it's hot in there and the lamp in the living room won't turn on, the TV in the bedroom won't turn on, and you go out in the garage and flip the circuit breaker and now everything works, well, that's the way we do medicine now, is we figure out which circuit breaker is out, go fix it, turn you back on, and let your body heal itself, which it does very well if it has the voltage, the nutrients, and deal with the toxins. Thank you for allowing me to be here.